Welcome back to Doctor and Forensics. Today we're going to do a part two to Out of Order. I feel somewhat compelled to speak to the household of faith, specifically about us individually as believers to help get our house in order. Well, we picked up last time talking about the out of order relationships and we hop skipped and jumped through the scriptures correctly just to lay the foundation about what God has said about relationships and what our corresponding res responsibility is and action should be. So let's talk about the here and now. The here and now in 2024 is the distractions that have led us down this road that Satan has plotted to erode the relationships which is the foundation for any society which is the foundation for true faith in Christ because what people see is exactly what they're not seeing. They're seeing us behave just like the world behaves and it should not be so. So if you're a believer in Christ and you're a man and you're a believer in Christ and you're a woman, we have a foundation, we have guidelines, we have the word of God and it's only there we can find our true focus points about relationships. Now I know I'm speaking to people who are married, people who are not married, people who used to be married. I can throw myself in that category. But the point being is the Bible is still correct and we're still obligated to adhere to what the Bible says regardless of our status and regardless of how we feel about it. So today we're going to get into Out of Order Part 2. Let's eliminate the distractions now in just a second. Now recently in the news we've heard about a couple of well-known ministers that have unfortunately had been exposed about behaviors in their past that have to do with inappropriate sexual behavior. One was Robert Morris and the other is Tony Evans. So this video is not a pile-on. I don't feel the need nor do we want to go back over ground that's been covered by so many. But it is important that we use the word of God as a ballast to understand how do we actually end up in these places. And I say we because some of us are still in bad places, coming from bad places and going to bad places when it comes to relationships. So the disclaimer at the top here, this particular video is for believers. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you're more than welcome to listen in. But this is actually not pointed towards you. In fact, if you're on the road to try to find out why men and women behave the way that they do, I would highly suggest you go back and listen to the first video because at large we have a spiritual problem which started back in the Garden of Eden. So go watch the first video that we made in this topic series, Out of Order, Animosity from the Beginning, because to understand where I'm going, you have to understand that. So that's hopefully a bit helpful as we move forward. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, I'm picking up where Paul says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. Keep that in mind. The body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised up the Lord, but he will also raise us up through his power. Question, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So I'll stop right there. Now this begs the question, what actual type of believer are you? If you're male, are you a convenient Christian? Are you loyal to the Lord when it's convenient? Or are you a female and you become a Christian feminist? You love everything about Christianity until it impedes upon what you think are your rights. Let's continue. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, from whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, as I said earlier, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So this is a crux issue for most men and women. 
because our loyalty first should be to the Lord. And if our loyalty is the Lord, it should make it much easier for us to be loyal to our wives and to our husbands. But it's not so the case. At the top of the monologue, I mentioned that we have these called distractions. And as of late, in particular since the onset of the Internet, the distractions have come in a form of so many things that prioritizing the things of God is just not that important. And it causes fractions in the relationship structure and into being able to develop a solid relationship. I found an article online by Medical News Today that talked about how does social media affect relationships? Well, this particular article was quite passive in its approach. It was giving some positive effects on social media and relationships. But again, that is the byline. They sold us on social media being able to do some beautiful things. And of course, that's always the hand to say and everything's pretty be be until it's not. Um, one of the lies that it tells us is that it helps boost connectivity and that social media can help us connect with friends in other cities, states, other countries, and platforms such as Instagram and Facebook are quickly convenient. Well, they are very c convenient. In fact, they're very sinister. And so let's just keep this real. Those platforms in, and on their own, they're, they're good on the surface, but because we are sinful and wicked people, those platforms don't want to get used correctly. And since I'm talking to believers, um, the call to action here is let's adjust how we're using these platforms. Um, this article goes on to talk about how it helps to improve communication. Clinical psychologist Margaret E. Morris, PhD, uh, says that, that the technology can help bring value to the partnership. Well, I don't even like the word partnership. I like the word relationship. And if you're married and you're a believer, you're looking for exactly that. Dr. Morris talked about how uh, parents sharing self-help apps with children to work through an argument, discussing romantic relationships. There's a ton of that content out on social media. And then you've got WhatsApp, texting through an argument. I mean, these are all, they sound so great on the surface, but nothing can replace the value of actually having a heartfelt conversation with somebody eye to eye, face to face, so you can understand their tone, you can deliver true empathy or sympathy where needed. So this here is just bunk. We can throw this out, this is trash. And then they try to talk about how it's positive to use social media in, as an aid to sexual gratification. That this is a lie. I don't care how many, I don't care what they say, this is an absolute lie. I mean, concerning romantic relationships, social media might actually help partners achieve sexual gratification. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. This sends people into pornographic sites consuming content that does nothing but erode and corrupt the heart and the mind of both men and women and children and on and on. This is not positive. God did not intend us to stroll over looking at nude and naked bodies for gratification as an aid to our relationships. That's a lie. So they try to bring some balance to this article talking about the negative effects on social media. I can go on and on. It, it fuels impairment in relationship. Uh, yes, it does. There is no face to face communication at large since the full rollout of the Internet on public platforms in 1996. It's just gotten worse. I can actually say that I spent half my life with the Internet and half my life without the part without was way better. Simply put, I had better relationships. People actually had to keep their word. They called you up at 705. They kept their word. They were honest, they couldn't ghost you. They had an issue with you. They had to speak with you either in person or on the phone. You got to hear their voice. There's no benefit to texting except for, hey, I'll be there in five minutes. Obviously, this article goes on to talk about that there's a decrease in quality time and relationship satisfaction. Absolutely. The next time you go to a restaurant, just notice how many people have their face staring down into the black mirror. It does not build relationship. It actually impedes them and it disrupts them. Another negative provides an avenue for inf infidelity related behaviors. I don't e even need to comment on that. Absolutely. In fact, most infidelity related behaviors start on a cell phone. We all have these cell phones. They're, they're literal spiritual hand grenades. 
at any given moment you can find yourself in trouble because of a cell phone. Satan has plotted and now we have technology which is supposed to be beneficial and if you're not disciplined, if you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you are going to blow your fingers off, your toes off, you're going to blow up a relationship, you're going to blow yourself up. It takes godly discipline and self-control to be able to understand how to use these devices and at large believers are worse at it than people who are not believers we just do a better job with hiding it now grab your bible and let's go back to first corinthians we're in chapter seven i have to say that the apostle paul gets eviscerated for his take and his concession and his commandments on marriage and no one really likes what he has said, which is why we should actually read what he says, because what he said is true and needs to be heeded, in particular, if you are a believer. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Absolutely. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5, stop depriving one another. Now, we know in context, Paul has definitely talked about the intimate sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. And again, looking forward to 2024, stop depriving right there at the top of verse five is very important because we have deprived one another. You know, anytime that you allow social media or some other distraction to take the place or to preempt the time that's needed for your relationship, you are depriving your spouse, your significant other of time, of attention, of empathy, of sympathy, of concern, of compassion. Ask yourself a question, believer. Is there anything that I'm doing that's depriving my spouse right now? Now, if you're being honest, there probably is something. So use this as an opportunity for a personal self-check. So I'm going to pick up back at verse 5. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Just because you have a lack of self-control does not mean you should get married. If you cannot overcome inordinate sexual lust and immorality, as a single, if you cannot get that handled, do not get married because getting married does not make it easier. It actually makes it worse because we walk into relationship with these unrealistic expectations of our spouse, men and women both. And that creates all types of issues. It creates a level of dissatisfaction that's inordinate, that is steeped and actually created by sin. So just because you're burning with lust and you want to get married does not mean that you should get married. What it takes before you do that is do you have the mind, heart, will, and emotion? Has the Holy Spirit work within your heart to help you develop the self-discipline in addition to the other fruit of the Spirit to give you the biblical temperance to be obedient to Christ first and then to be able to do what Ephesians chapter 5 says to do. Verse 6, so Paul gives his opinion here. Listen carefully. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one to this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried, Paul still give an opinion, and to the widows, that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So to each their own. And there's no argument for or against marriage. And Paul gives a concession to say, hey, this is what I think. Now, next, Paul goes from giving his opinion to giving instructions. Verse 10, but to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband 
in that the husband should not be divorced from his wife. That goes both ways, men or women. Verse 12, but to the rest I say not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not he must, she must not send her husband away for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband or otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him or her leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So here's where theology will condemn you and only grace can free you. There's many people that I know that have been married and are divorced and they carry a dark cloud over their head. I understand that feeling a little too well, unfortunately. But the point I'm making is when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was he not considering that sin in and before you and I actually ever walked the earth? Of course he did. So to each person I say, that's a matter of you to take to the Lord. Staying divorced, getting remarried. Only God can give you the grace and direction as to what you can do. Because the word of God, and when you read it, it will hurt you. It will certainly provide boundaries of what to do from an Old Testament standpoint. But if you read the Bible from an Old Testament standpoint and don't read it in the light of a New Testament standpoint, then you're not right and divide the truth. Therefore, no one can actually be your judge in that matter. You need to take that matter to the Lord. Now, I'm going to get blown up in the comments for that, which is perfectly OK, because no man and no woman can actually give a judgment about what should or shouldn't happen because God deals with us as individuals. God knows the intent of our hearts. God knows every situation from beginning to the end. He knows the situation between the woman, between the man. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. He knows everything in between. So that situation needs to be taken to the Lord. Now, I heard this preacher tell a story one time, and it was a great story about a young couple, and they were living in sin. They weren't, they weren't Christians, and they had gotten saved, but they were really, really in love. And the preacher said that they came to him and the man came in particular and said, hey, you know, uh, I got in this relationship with this woman and uh, she uh, was married and she had gotten divorced and I was the cause of it. But here we are some years later, we both got saved and I really still love her. Do you think I should actually get married to her or is it OK to get married to her? The end of that story the person that he asked the question to pastor didn't answer his question. He sent that young man and woman away to do one thing. He says, it's not for me to say because I don't have enough information to know where you come from, what you did and how you got there. But what you can do as believers is take it to the Lord in prayer. So to that end, everybody's severally in a different situation, which means everything that you do as an individual needs to go to the Lord because at the end of it all, he is the judge of any and all things and in particular what we do. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, Peter's laying out that we should follow Christ and use him as our example. It reads, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and to live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed by his wounds we were spiritually healed for you were continually strained like sheep but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guarding of your souls so here's what we get to do if God gives you your reset Peter says like Paul says in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husband so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word 
they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Ladies, you also get to make sure that your adornment be not merely external with the braiding of hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and putting on dresses. And we're talking about things that are important, but not the priority here. Don't be excessive in that, ladies. Verse four, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle, quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Verse five, in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God, don't miss that part, who hoped in God, God was first, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, show her honor as a fellow heir in the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving blessings instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Saints, in conclusion, when I read my Bible, the Bible really doesn't say a lot about marriage. In fact, most of what we should be as believers is encompassed in developing godly character and if we have done such then the things in marriage will have taken care of itself some of us find ourselves on the outside of god's institution of marriage because we fail god absolutely hates divorce in fact he hates it so much that he even said he divorced his own people because they had bad behavior now, is God interested in reconciling with his own people? He said that he would. And if God said that he would, then that means that God will. So let's not stand outside of God's grace on the matter. But let's also stand responsible and accountable in the matter of relationships. Let's not be guilty of the very things that the world is guilty of. Let's decide to not be distracted by using the tools, devices, and platforms which basically deprive our spouses, friends, family, relationships from what they need. They need our attention, need our 100% undivided attention. Don't let Satan ruin what God has given you. We've all let Satan ruin something that God has given us because we were disobedient. I guess the appeal in all of this video in terms of us being out of order, what will it take for us to consider putting effort into getting back into order? I know one thing, if repentance is leading that, there definitely is blessings coming behind it. I want to thank you for listening to Doctrine Forensics. If you like this material, please click, like, subscribe, comment, and share. God bless you and your family.